Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to talk about movements of the thoracic spine and the associated rib movements. So really, we're going to be focusing more on movements of the ribs with both thoracic flexion and thoracic extension. In the next video, we'll be looking at lateral flexion and rotation, but we'll see similar patterns there. Now, here is the thoracic spine, T1 down to T12, and hopefully we know that the ribs articulate with these vertebrae. Okay, there are 12 ribs, they all attach to the vertebra in some form or fashion. And so if I have a movement of the thoracic spine as a whole, doesn't matter which movement, those ribs are going to in turn move in a certain way as well, just by nature that they're attached to the T-spine. Before we get into these particular movements right here, um, let's talk about a few things, okay? Uh, number one, um, the ribs articulate in two ways with the vertebra, costovertebral joints and costotransverse joints. But the joints that we're going to be worried about for the movement of the ribs are going to be the costotransverse joints. Um, the upper ribs, which are generally considered basically ribs one through six, those costotransverse joints are going to allow more rotational movements. When we get below the sixth rib, those costotransverse joints do not do rotation. They're going to do more gliding translating movements, okay? So that's why you see this discrepancy here with upper costovertebral joints being rotation and the lower ones being gliding or translations, okay? So hopefully that makes sense. Now let's get into this. So here's our thoracic spine and let's talk about flexion. So flexion would be bending forward, right? If you want to bend forward to touch your toes. So the vertebral movement is going to be net flexion. That's the osteokinematic movement. So as a whole, all the vertebra are going to flex forward. The arthrokinematic movement is upsloping. And so whenever you go into thoracic flexion, um, the superior vertebra is going to glide both superiorly and anteriorly relative to the vertebra below. Okay, so for example, if we talk about um, T5 during flexion, it's going to glide superiorly and anteriorly relative to T6. T6 would glide superiorly and anteriorly relative to T7. Okay, that's upsloping and that occurs during flexion. Now we've actually seen this type of upsloping in the C-spine and lumbar spine as well. Now for understanding uh, these rib movements and particularly upper uh, ribs, it's really this anterior glide that I care about for that the vertebrae do. And if it doesn't make sense what I'm talking about here, I'm going to show you a video that I actually used with fruit, and it'll actually ironically explain in uh, three dimensions with movement um, actually how this is going to occur. So when the superior vertebra slides anteriorly on, uh, relative to the vertebra below, it's going to kind of move this rib with it. And it's going to move it in such a way that at the costotransverse joint, um, there's going to be anterior rotation, okay? And this is for the upper ribs, by the way, so the upper costotransverse joint. So how do I know if rotation of the rib is anterior or posterior? The way to think about it is take right here near the tubercle of the rib and just put a dot there, okay, right on the top. If the rotation occurs such that the dot moves anteriorly, it's going to be anterior rotation. If the dot moves posteriorly like it will over here, it's posterior rotation, okay? Now think about this movement for a second. If I anteriorly rotate this rib like this, what's going to happen to the front of the ribs? And this is what I'll be able to observe more easily, is the ribs overall are going to rotate downwards. They're going to have an inferior rotation. So the upper ribs, as a result of anterior rotation at the costotransverse joint, uh, they're going to have a net inferior rotation. This is in contrast to what happens at the, in the lower ribs. So for the lower costotransverse joints, they're going to have a superior glide during flexion, and then the ribs are therefore going to have a superior translation. So even though the rotation and, and translation, even though the types of movements are different, notice what's happening during thoracic flexion. Okay, the upper ribs are rotating down, the lower ribs are translating up. Want to put it even simpler, upper ribs go down, lower ribs go up. What do you think is happening 
to the space between the ribs. Well, the ribs are getting closer together. If the upper ribs are rotating down and the lower ribs are translating up, all the ribs are coming closer together. They're all approximating. And why would that make sense during thoracic flexion? Well, if you're bending over to touch your toes, there's less space in here for the ribs. So if there's less space, it would make sense for all the ribs to approximate, to come closer together. And the best way to do that is for the upper ribs to inferiorly rotate and the lower ribs to superiorly translate. When we undergo thoracic flexion, remember that's upsloping. So this superior vertebra is gonna move anteriorly, okay? Technically superiorly and anteriorly, but I'm concerned about that anterior motion. So when the superior vertebra moves anteriorly, notice what happens when I do that. It's gonna cause that rib to do a little anterior rotation. Watch that again. Because it's sandwiched in between there, when this superior vertebra moves anteriorly and upsloping, it rotates that rib anteriorly. And that's gonna cause the rib overall to rotate downwards. So again, watch what happens if the superior vertebra moves anteriorly. So toward the screen, that's in thoracic flexion. Okay, when it moves forward, we get anterior rotation of that rib, and look what happened. It had an overall downward rotation. So that anterior rotation is gonna cause overall downward rotation of the upper ribs. Okay, so that's thoracic flexion. A couple of things about this movement. One, it's typical range of motion. This is passive range of motion. It's about 30 to 40 degrees in the T-spine. And exhalation induces slight flexion. Now, I want to clarify this statement. When you breathe out, when you exhale, there's a little bit of flexion that's induced in the thoracic spine. Flexion does not cause exhalation. Remember, breathing mechanics have to do with contraction and relaxation of the diaphragm and other muscles. So flexion doesn't cause exhalation, but if you exhale, it will induce a slight amount of thoracic flexion. Okay? Now for thoracic extension. So everything's gonna be the opposite here. So what are the movements that happen during thoracic extension? Well, this would be like um, certain yoga movements where you're bending your spine backwards. Um, or if you're touching your toes and you wanna stand back up, that would be extension, okay? So what happens during extension? Well, obviously the osteokinematic movement is the, all the vertebrae are extending, right? They're going in this direction. But now you're going to have what's called downsloping. And this is going to involve inferior or posterior glide of the superior vertebra relative to the vertebra below. So again, with this example, if T5 downslopes during extension, T5 is going to translate or glide posteriorly or inferiorly relative to T6. T6 will glide posteriorly, inferiorly relative to T7. And this occurs throughout the T-spine in extension. But just like over here in flexion, I cared about anterior glide, really the posterior glide is gonna make um, this um, make a little bit more sense, particularly when we look at the animation um, in a couple of minutes like we did for flexion. So um, when the superior vertebra glides posteriorly relative to the vertebra below, it induces a little bit of rotation in the rib at the costal transverse joint. And that rotation is gonna be posterior rotation. Remember, if I take that dot and put it right on the top of the, of the rib, probably closest to the uh, tubercle, um, if I do this movement, it's gonna cause that dot to move backwards, so posteriorly. So this would be posterior rotation at the costotransverse joint for the upper ribs. And if you think about what's gonna happen when that posterior rotation occurs, overall the rib moves up, okay? Um, there's gonna be a net superior rotation of the upper ribs. Now, just like we saw the opposite occur in the lower ribs here, same thing's gonna be for extension, the opposite. So remember the lower costal transverse joints allow gliding movement. So the lower costal transverse joint here in extension is gonna be associated with inferior glide, which means the lower ribs are gonna have a net inferior translation. So again, to put this in perspective, the upper ribs rotate up, the lower ribs translate down, or to put it even more simply, the upper ribs move up, the lower ribs move down. And so if you imagine that, all the ribs are gonna uh, get further apart from each other, they're gonna separate. Why would that make sense in thoracic extension? Well, if you think about a movement in particular where you almost put your spine in hyperextension, so like a prone push-up or certain yoga movements, I think up dog is an example of that, um, where your spine is uh, well past neutral, it's in hyperextension, there's more space for your ribs. 
right? There's more space. So if there's more space for the ribs, they can come farther apart. And so the upper ribs move up or superiorly rotate, the lower ribs move down or inferior translate. And so that causes all the ribs to separate because there's more space to accommodate those ribs. If I go into extension of the thoracic spine with that down sloping and I get that posterior translation of the superior vertebra, watch what happens. I move it posteriorly and now that dot rotates posteriorly. So I have posterior rotation of that rib and also notice that the rib rotates upward. Okay, If I go into extension, so let's move this superior vertebra posteriorly, that's going to trigger that uh, posterior rotation and notice in posterior rotation What's the overall rotation of the rib? It's superior rotation. Okay, so if you think about these movements in terms of thoracic flexion, there's less space, so the ribs are gonna approximate. In extension, there's more space, so they're gonna separate. You can kind of reason through these movements if you remember the upper joints are gonna be rotation and the lower joints are translation. Now a couple other things here for thoracic extension, the typical range of motion is gonna be for passive at least 20 to 25 degrees range of motion. And then just like over here for flexion, um, inhalation induces slight extension of the T-spine. So this does not mean that extension causes inhalation. Of course not. The diaphragm contracting causes inhalation. Um, so it's not the other way around. But when you inhale, it does induce a slight amount of thoracic extension. Okay, um, And so you'll get a little bit of these movements when you inhale. But generally speaking, we're talking about net big movements, thoracic flexion, thoracic extension, cause these movements of the ribs. So hopefully this video um, cleared up some things about thoracic spine movement and associated rib movements. In the next video, we're going to be doing the same thing for thoracic spine lateral flexion and rotation, so join us then. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.